<laughs> it was a fun chat. Thanks so much. It was a really fun chat. Thanks for all your good preparation work. Right? Um, and I'm always so refreshed and inspired by folks like you who are really good conversationalists, really have insights to offer as well, really make it enjoyable and really do, do some great prep work. You make the podcasting work so, so meaningful. So thank you for that. Welcome to the Relatable Leader Podcast. This is your behind the scenes access to coaching that supports your leadership. And now here's your host, certified trainer and professional coach, Catherine Goja. Hello, leaders. Thanks for being here. You know, I appreciate you taking time to listen and subscribe to the Relatable Leader Podcast. And wow, do I ever have a great episode for you today. I got to talk with Ron Carucci. He is the co-founder and managing partner at Navalent. He works with CEOs and executives who are, now check this out. This is some beautiful stuff right here. He works with people who are pursuing transformational change for their organizations, leaders, and industries. He is the co-author of the book, Rising to Power, The Journey of Exceptional Executives, and has more than 30 years of experience in a leadership advisory role. He is also a contributor to the Harvard Business Review and Forbes. Ron is a two-time TEDx speaker, and he lives in Seattle and joined me on Skype. Ron Carucci, welcome to the Relatable Leader podcast. Hi. Let's start with your consulting firm's name, Navalent. How did you choose it, and what does it mean for you? Uh, well, great to be with you, Catherine. Thanks for having me. So, so Navalent is literally the blending of two words: um, navigate, uh, which you know the, the, the notion of how we, finding our way in the world, finding our way through. And valence. Valence is the chemical process by which chemical bonds, when you're trying to get a chemical reaction to happen, have to find each other and bond together in order to, in order to provoke some type of a transformative reaction to provoke change. So the word navalent literally means navigating the bonds of transformation, which I think for us is what, how we see our work in the world, is helping our leaders navigate the connections, the bonds, the relationships, the dots to connect uh, to create valence in their organizations. Thanks for asking. Next, in your work of overhauling leadership, which I love, the, I love the whole combination of words, overhauling leadership. It's very mechanical and practical, which I like. And then also overhauling cultures with the goal of helping organizations redesigning growth. I know your starting place is to learn about the organization that you're working with. And Ron, can you tell people who might be interested in contacting you, what does that look like when you come on in and start to get to know what they're all about? Yeah, great question. So in our, in our world, we, just like medical science, we believe that treatment without diagnosis is malpractice. People who come in with their one-size-fits-all shticks and models and frameworks, um, God bless them, there's a role for them, but I think they can be very dangerous. We have the term organization transformation on our websites for a reason, but there are people out there who have organization transformation on their websites, and when you find out what they do, it's everybody, everybody gets a Myers-Briggs. Mm -hmm. So for us, it really is, you know, you, you wouldn't go into the hospital, <clears throat> say I've got, real, I've got this really sharp pain right here in my chest, and have your cardiologist say, oh, upper left ventricle stint, seen it a million times, let's go <laughs> in, without an MRI. Right. And so for us, an MRI on the organization really comes down to, we do some deep forensic interviews. We have people tell us things they would never tell their mother because they're really, the protocols are deeply structured. We get lots of, you know, both cognitive, financial, and emotional data on performance on, on a variety of aspects of the full system, strategy, culture, people, governance, process, technology, and results. And then we take all that data and we code it. So we have a, a proprietary software program we use to help code the data to, to organize it into emerging patterns and themes that we then present back to the leadership. So, so the leaders of the organization get to hear the voices of people they have sent out of the room. 
it's, it's a forced listening opportunity to say, these are the voices you're not going to ever get access to and have arranged your organization to not have access to. But here's the story of your organization they are telling. And there's 70 or 80 pages of a novel that, that is also a mirror that leaders have to look into. And we spent a day or two in a room with them pouring through the insights. We, there's a three-page instruction manual on how to read that report because it, it's triggering. There's emotions. There's defenses. There's confusion. There's relief. And so we teach them, here's how to metabolize this information and how to prepare for the two days we're going to spend together. So they have a lot of work to do before they come in the room. And then they have to talk to each other about the story, about the surprises, the, sh- the things they didn't expect, the things they knew were there, but they can't believe anybody actually wrote down. And come to some conclusions. And we and they have to do all of that before they ever hear a point of view from us. Because we believe that it's their story to fix and write and direct, not ours. We believe that if we short circuit that that synthesis with our point of view, that it's gonna, you know, de defa- de facto just sort of to turn to us. And we don't ever want our point of view to trump theirs. So um, our point of view on, you know, based on the hundreds of organizations we've seen, here's our take on your story, mm-hmm. but only is after you are honest and own your take on the story. As I'm listening to you, uh, literally, I started to get some adrenaline going because it's so exciting to hear a very different approach that could actually be useful and is not canned. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. I think I think a lot of consulting firms go in and do quick surveys or a couple of focus groups, but I, I know the tools. They're retrofitting the focus groups. They're retrofitting the data they collect into a model they've already believed fits the organization's problems. Right. And then what they present back are snippets of their data, you know, retrofit into the recommendations they want to make. Um, and sometimes they're close and, or they're helpful, but they're almost always incomplete. And it dis- I think it dishonors the story of the organization. Right. Which is full of which is full of contradictions and pain, and confusion and hope and excitement, and you've got to give the leaders access to the full story. Otherwise, what value are you adding? Well, I'm I'm loving that. And here in Northern California, where I work, many organizations have been working with their top leaders not just for a few years, but in some cases in this area, decades run, yeah. and they think, they believe, which I can totally understand, that they already know each other, that they already know, you know, all there is to know, that they've already built such a trust that everybody is open. And I've seen this across industries as well. And so as I listen to you describe your tool, I would imagine that you've seen people such as I'm describing still be very surprised by the story that comes out. Would that be accurate? It's a very accurate statement, Catherine. It's so interesting how people confuse nearness for closeness. Oh, I love that. Um, You know, knowing about someone is not the same as knowing them. Um, Knowing about someone means you know your version of them. You know know the concoction of them in your mind that's filtered through your own biases and lenses and beliefs. Um, Or if you're at the top of the house, you know the embodiment of their function. So your head of marketing is first your head of marketing. And if you're head of sales, they're your enemy. Yes. Right. right. That's what you know about them. To know them as a human being, you've not bothered to move past that. Um, I'm always and I'm always fascinated where they talk about, well, they just say we need to trust each other more. And my response is always, well, why don't you start by telling each other the truth? Right. As you, you, you're telling me how much you're withholding from each other, how much you don't talk about the real issues, and then you're curious about why was a trust issue? Do you think that you all don't know that you're withholding the truth from each other? Right. You're all well aware because you're talking about it in the hallway, over the coffee pot, over the urinal, um, about what's not being said in the room. So everybody's clearly aware of what's not happening in the room. Right. Um, nobody should be gasping at the notion of why there's a trust issue. Yes, and you know, in the last few months, I've also been thinking about how telling ourselves that we trust each other can sometimes actually be a blocker to challenging each other when maybe we need to. Ha- have you seen that as well? Or what are your thoughts on that? It's a great, great insight, Catherine. It's so true. You know, um, trust is a currency, right? It's like an economy. And I may be trading in trust as um, I-, I may choose to extend or withhold it based on your character where you may choose to extend it with whole trust based on my competence. 
right. someone else may choose to extend it with it based on a personality trait, whereas a, someone else may choose to extend it with it based on how much you are or are not like me. And so if we have multiple currencies, uh, economies operating in the room, and I don't know what yardstick you're holding up to me to evaluate trust, I'm going to assume it's mine. Right. And I'm going to assume that I'm going to earn your trust based on how I want to, I want you to, you to win mine, um, which could be the very thing that causes you to distrust me. And so we confuse collegiality and the absence of dissent as trust, when actually that could be the greatest, the greatest indicator of a lack of trust, which is we're not fighting. Um, I ask leaders all the time, when is the last time one of your people came into your office unsolicited and gave you feedback on how they experienced you as a leader that was unpleasant to hear, but truthful? And if you can't tell me that that happened within the last four weeks, um, something is wrong. You're not doing your job because if you're not pissing somebody off, you're not leading. Two, they don't trust you um, because you should have a regular pathway into your office of people feeling comfortable and confident and respectful of you enough to tell you about the things you can't see. So if neither of those things is happening, that is not good news. And you should not assume it, there's all this copacetic and trusting. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm so glad I asked you about that. Relatable leader audience out there, I hope that if you happen to check out for a little bit right there, if you're on the treadmill or driving down the road and you didn't catch every word of what Ron just said, please, at the end, rewind it and listen to it again. That's fantastic. And and one of the reasons it is fantastic for me, Ron, is that you're explaining it in a way that I haven't heard other people explain it. So I definitely thank you for that. Uh, transitioning now into the next question, my closing statement for each episode includes the encouragement to lead by example. And in one of your TEDx talks, you talk about being powerful and using our power for the good. So as you lead by example, I wondered if you could please share how you have recently used your power for the good. Mm. You know, part of what I believe leading for good means is mean, it means leading out loud and letting people know what is really happening authentically for you. And I had to, um, I had to have a really, really hard conversation with somebody in my firm uh, who's also a dear friend. Mm. Um, and it was a very, very painful conversation uh, that could have been really hard. Mm -hmm. But I reminded myself of two things. I respect him and I love him and I care about him and I care about his future, regardless of how difficult this conversation is. And I knew I wanted those things to prevail over my need to be right mm -hmm. or my need to be heard or my need to have him change. Um, and when I was able to set aside and tell and, and say those things out loud to him at the start of the conversation so that uh, I didn't forget them, right? Because we all get triggered in moments in ways we don't expect and we yes. suddenly go down rabbit holes we wish we hadn't gone down. And so I think for me, saying out loud what was important and asking him what was important to him um, helped us navigate very perilous waters together mm -hmm. um, and come out the other side okay. Um, doesn't, didn't make it any less difficult or more painful to have the conversation, but, um, you know, recognize that, that there are values and principles I don't want to violate in this conversation, um, was important to say out loud to him. And I wish leaders would spend one of the hardest things for most executives when they rise up is they, they, they don't understand that their life's on a jumbotron now, right? There, there, there's a, a megaphone strapped to them out 24 seven, everything they say and do is being misinterpreted, concocted, misunderstood, mis, misinterpreted. And so they get confused by that. They just assume, well, if I think it, they'll understand it. Mm -hmm. They don't take the time to lead out loud, to say, uh, to tell people how to interpret their actions and how not to. And I wish leaders, you know, part of using your power for good is making sure people understand how you want to serve them, yes. how you want to care for them, how you want to develop them, what it is about their agenda you want to support. Not just the util utilitarian part of what is it they can do for your agenda. Right. And we, we just often take it for granted. You know, we just think I'm a good person. They'll know. They'll know. Well, well the thing about the way you handled that conversation is you actually used your values as context for the rest of the conversation. And I think that action-oriented people a lot of times don't take the time to provide context. Like you say, well, they'll know. And so therefore, at some point when things are going sideways, they try to backtrack and then talk about what's important and why we're having this conversation. 
but I really value how you set that groundwork going into a very difficult conversation. And I, I picture as I'm listening to you, Ron, that it took courage for both of you to, to see that through. Well, there's, there's no question there was a lot of anxiety in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had to, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to work hard in the world to help people disaggregate courage and truth telling. Because I don't think telling the truth ought, ought to require courage; it just ought to require compassion, um, and and a sense of obligation. Mm. Um, and I think I think to your point, too many leaders get into conversations and then they try and backtrack when they realize it's gone sideways. The problem, of course, is that at that point it's too late because now everything you say is going to be seen as an agenda or manipulative mm-hmm. or or half truth. Um, and so I do think that you know, we, we I think we've conflated speaking your truth with speaking the truth. Right. Right. So I, I recognized in that conversation, he was probably going to have a very different point of view than mine. And I that needed to be OK. I, yes. My goal was not to convince him of my being right. My goal was to have him understand why I felt the way I felt. But then I needed to also understand how he felt the way he did. Mm-hmm. Um, and I learned things I had never considered before. And so did he. And I think if you walk into a conversation, assuming beneficial intent, assuming that there is. Um, you know, somebody didn't try and set out maliciously to do something really misguided or unhelpful or destructive and allow and, and set out to learn about, you know, you, you had an expectation, something other than that happened. Find out why mm-hmm. rather than, you know, you know, make sure people know how upset you are about it. Mm. I think the point you make about obligation is really central to the idea, a question that I like to ask people before they agree to a promotion, for example, is, well, tell me why you want to be in a leadership position. And eventually in that same conversation, do you care enough about people to support their growth? You care enough about the people to do the truth telling that you're talking about. And I appreciate that you were able to do that. I think so many leaders um, you they have they have one of two extremes. They're either you know reckless, mean Attilas, <laughs> or they're you know benevolent dictators, and they don't uh, they, and they only blow smoke at people and never tell them the truth. Um, it is it, to allow someone to struggle or not perform uh, is one of the cruelest things you can do. If you think withholding hard feedback um, from someone is any is any has any form of kindness to it, you're deluded. It's cruel. Yes. Um, it's your job to help them get better. Leadership is the ability to disappoint people at a rate they can absorb. And if you don't understand that, you shouldn't be leading. Um, and yes, if you lead, you'll suffer. Right? Yes. It, is a, it, is, it is a private sacrificial experience. You have to find other things you want to be gratified by and learn to be gratified by not being the doer, but making others better doers. Yes. Um, and if you're not gratified by those things and you're not willing to make the sacrificial suffering it takes to get there – and not willing to disappoint people when the greater good has to prevail, then leadership's probably not for you. Which is okay, because we need everybody on all levels, right? Absolutely. That's that's what I tell people. If you find out that leadership is not a good fit for you, no harm, no foul. I would rather have you realize that than have people get hurt by poor leadership. Absolutely. Amen. It's it's not only is it cruel to yourself, but it's cruel to other people to stay in a leadership role where you know you're not effective and then convince yourself that you'll be okay. Yes. In fact, it's not okay. Right. Well, that leads me to the topic of uh, consistency. And I think consistency is important in leadership and would like for you to please share, Ron, your morning coffee cup ritual with our listeners and (laughs) explain how that activity creates a positive mindset as you start each day. And so you can go out with consistent quality as a leader. Uh, uh, So um, down in the conference room in the offices here, uh, is also where our kitchen and coffee and, is. And I have a cabinet full of a, a bunch of coffee mugs that I've collected from different experiences in different locations and when I was with different people. And each one of them is probably, gosh, there must be 30 or 40 in there now. But each of them has a different person's face in my mind attached to them. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a family member, a friend, a colleague, a, a client, a city that I'm you know particularly passionate about. And so when I pick my coffee mug in the morning, it's sort of a, it's a moment of gratitude. It's a moment for me to remember that person, that experience, to smile, to cry, to reflect. 
And so it's a, you know, for that whole cup of coffee, it's a chance for me to think about um, my story is not my own. I'm part of a much bigger story. And there are a lot of people, a lot of characters in my story for whom I need to be grateful for and remember and keep in mind that I'm not the center character in this story all the time. And it's, it's a great way to begin a, begin a day of helping other people or doing work for other people or sometimes work that's not so fun. Mm-hmm. That, you know, the story is not just what's in front of me. The story is a much bigger one. And there's, there's a cast cast of lots of people around me in the story that to be mindful of us. But, you know, we, we work virtually, work in our own homes, work in, sometimes in very isolated forms. Mm-hmm. And it's easy. To, it's so easy to forget all that. And so for me, it's a chance to sort of pause and reflect and... I wish I could tell you that it consistently followed me throughout the day in terms of a great attitude of thankfulness. It doesn't always do that. And sometimes, sometimes, sadly, uh, not under an hour after having the coffee cup, you would never know that I had the moment. <laughs> well, I think we can all re- relate to that. I think the intention, though, to set that mindset first thing in the day is a decision and and a habit. And you know, yeah, there are those days where we might need to go back at our break, get a new coffee cup, lunch, get a new coffee cup. <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, get, we get, there are those days. <laughs> we, get right? we get second chances. We get do-overs. It's so true. Oh, I, I like rituals that demonstrate the intention. Yeah. That it keeps you humble to recognize that mm-hmm. you're just one piece of the bigger picture. Yeah. And I think for many leaders, you know, the word I love about you, know, you use the word consistency. I think so often many leaders, especially executives, um, confuse what that really means with what they need to do as a leader. They, I think they all think it means I need to be the same all the time. And that's, of course, the last thing. it. Should, right. Um, but what it really needs to mean is predictable. Right. I think your people need to not be they, at some point. Your, your people should be able to decode you mm-hmm. and know what to expect. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you, you can be consistently inconsistent, but at least they know what to expect. But if they never know which version of you is going to show up to a question or a conversation or bad news or the need for help or um, a missed deadline, if they, if they never know which version of you th- they could reasonably predict is going to um, o- offer them something, that's not good because that means they're hiding from you. And I'm right there with you. Yeah, because it's so unsettling. Right. And, I, and I've, I'm, if the safest thing for you is me to hide and fill out balance... Um, you do. If you have people hiding from you in any way, be very afraid because you are sitting on a, some kind of a time bomb that will go off. Yeah. Um, it's that's a that's a I can make that prediction with a lot of certainty, um, and I take you to Vegas and bet odds on it. If people are hiding things from you, or hiding themselves from you, or hiding information from you in the slightest form, that's a reason for you to go get your own coffee mug and reflect on why is that. And the yeah. question isn't what's wrong with them that they can't be themselves. The question is, what have I done to make an environment that they believe does not welcome all of them? There you go. Yes. Well, and I thank you because your your summary of what consistency means and what it does not mean is right in sync with uh, my perspective as well. Because too many times um, leaders give their leadership style away to their moods and and then you're right. People tell me, well, we we know what kind of day it's going to be just by the way he or she walks down the hall in the morning. Isn't and, that so fun? Amen. I love that expression. Give their they give it away to their moods. That's a great expression because it's a for you, you it's a forfeiture, right? It's a choice. Right. Um, and I I love that when I we do our data collection or our, our diagnosis and I, we hear we know never to go in before two p.m. <laughs> or we know if it's, it's the last one in. He's a waffler. So we know that the you know if the meeting's going to start at four o'clock, be in at three fifty-five, and you'll get your way. Yes, it's they, you, people know how to work you. They yes. you, you you've trained them in some form, but yes. if it's not trained them in a, in a code you want them decoding, they're working you, um, and that's not a good thing. It, it's not well. This is going to lead us then into your four areas or patterns that you saw and and people can watch your YouTube videos for a deeper dive into the patterns of success you Mm -hmm. have identified through your research but I thought it would be useful for our audience if you could give us a brief overview on the importance of one context two breadth three choice and four connection Mm, yeah so thanks for asking about those um 
It, it was a, you know, so it was a 10 year study of more than 2,700 leaders that led us to those patterns. And of course, the patterns were initially about failure to try and find out why is it that more than half of leaders who ascend to broader perches fail in their first 18 months. And um, it became personal when it became one of our clients' organizations that failed. And so it was deeply painful to want to understand how could we have so badly misjudged what seemed as an otherwise, you know, um, bottomless degree of potential. Mm-hmm. So that we went to investigate one person's failure that led us to twenty year, 10 years of data. The interesting thing was that, you know, we kept wondering, well, if half of them are failing, what are the other half doing? You know, what, how are they sticking the landing? What is it that's setting them apart? Mm-hmm. And those were the four patterns. So context simply means um, you can read the tea leaves around you. There's not a one size fits all. You look around you to ask you and ask the question, why is it this way? Why is it happening that way? Why are our competitors doing that? Why are customers defecting that way? And you don't triage. You don't try to impose change, but you recognize that there's, you know, you may have as much to adapt in yourself as you have to change in the organization. And this is especially critical for newly entering leaders who believe they come with some mythical mandate. And we hear it all the time, right? New, new executives. Well, when I was at PepsiCo, you know, or whatever their last company mm-hmm. was, and all they're doing is looking to replicate past successes. And so you have to recognize that the things around you are that way for a reason, and you have to find out why. Um, breath means you have to go from playing first chair in the orchestra to playing conductor, right? So, you know, you may be used to seeing the world as a marketer, so you see the world through consumers. So you may be used to being a financial person, so you see the world economically. If you grew up in a silo, you just have to assume your your purview has been narrowed too much. But at the top of the organization, it's no longer about the the regions, the functions, the categories. It's about the whole of the of the sum of the parts. So, you know, innovation is the intersection of marketing, R&D, and consumer insights. Um, Cost effectiveness is the intersection of supply chain, marketing, uh, supply chain, logistics, and finance. Customer service is the intersection of customer success, sales, and technology. And those are capabilities you have to manage. And so the seams become the most important part of the organization, not the parts. If you can't build bridges across those seams and you're further in the division, (laughs) <laughs> then you're keeping the organization fragmented. And if you're doing that, you're making it weaker. So breadth means building bridges. It means I see how all the parts fit together and I try and create cohesion among them. Choice means the ability to say no. It's not just about your decision-making style in terms of how much data, how many people, how much intuition, how much time. Now, narrowing the focus of the organization being willing to say no to even great ideas so the commitments you've made can prevail. People, leaders who are too benevolent and give out way too many yeses because they don't want to disappoint people, dilute the organization's focus and, they, and you basically institutionalize mediocrity because you're doing so many things um, that you, you can't do any of them well. So, so, and so the last one is connection, which is relationships. It's the it's the people above you, um, on your on your peers, your direct reports. But the key differentiator in how you prior, these leaders prioritize their relationships was the people they could help. It was whose success can I drive? Whose agenda can I advance? Not who do I need things from, but what stakeholders are most relying on me? And that's a very big difference. Most executives prioritize the stakeholders on who they need stuff from. Mm-hmm. But these leaders prioritize the ones whose agendas they could ha- they could advance and in turn, of course, got the help they needed. So the, the hardest part of the research, Catherine, was that the exemplar leaders were good at all four of them. They were not good at three of the four. If you were good at three of the four, you were in the failure group. Oh, so we had, we, I made my research team do 99 different regression analyses on that data because I didn't want to have to say four, and, four or out. But the, finally, the research team was like, Ron, it's not going to change. It, it is what it is. And just <laughs> to clarify, Ron, you saw these four patterns across all industries. All industries, both genders. Um, various aspects of, gr- of growth maturity, um, profit, nonprofit, and across a ten-year a ten-year period of time, um, the the great the the hard news is it's all for or you you you're risking failure. The great news is they can all be learned, right? You can you can work on these things from the earliest parts of your career. How do you read context? How do you learn to work? If you're if you're in customer service, go find out what the salespeople think of you. You know, if you're in finance, go find out what the people in R&D whose budget you're cutting think of you. Mm-hmm. Go find, go take a walk to the places you think you're not welcome or that don't matter to you and find out how they're relying on your work. 
choice. Find out how your organization makes decisions. Sit in on the meetings where governance is happening, where trade-offs are being weighed, where priorities are being set. Find out uh, your own apparatus for choice making. And relationally, go build your network. Go find out who you can help. Go find out whose career you can help advance or whose problem you can help solve. We can we can build these muscles at the various er, very earliest parts of our career because if you wait till your first vice president job to start, that's probably a little bit too late. Right, because other people will have to suffer through your learning curve. <laughs> and and some it's very very true, Catherine. And some organizations may not be tolerant of that. That's that's the reason for the eighteen month failure. Yeah. Context, context, and uh, connection will be the two that cause you to fail fastest. Connection was the quickest failure, like three months. Mm. Context was shortly after that. Choice and breadth are contextual failures, meaning if your organization is already sucking at decision making, and so do you, you won't be noticed as quickly. If it's already a very fragmented, solid organization, your lack of breadth won't stand out so much. Right. So, right. But you'll still eventually fail if, you're, if you stay too narrow. But you have to get good at all four. The, early, the sooner you start, the better prepared you'll be for a bigger perch. We'll continue the interview with Ron right after this message. Live It, Mastering Positive Attitude Habits will help you work smart and live happy. Live It is a textbook and workbook in one, with note-taking and action planners designed into the book. The content is based on activities training participants rated with five stars for more than 15 years. What makes this book different from other attitude books is you have everything you need to move from thinking to doing, from waiting to changing, and from surviving to thriving. Even people who are generally positive appreciate these action assignments that help you shake off attitude blockers, reconnect with your life vision, and demonstrate the consistent behaviors to move closer to goals in every area of your life. Get the book on Amazon today and get to work in the eight key areas of your life. If nothing changes, nothing changes. Go to Amazon now and purchase Catherine Gogia's book, Live It! Mastering Positive Attitude Habits. Her 15 practical tips for managing your mindset have already inspired thousands of people and they can help you work smart and live happy too. That's so interesting that it requires all four. I would like to unpack choice just a little bit and run past you something that I think about and then see where you stand on it then because I noticed that many organizations expend like untold hours talking about what they would like to do or what they could do or maybe someday <laughs> will do but oftentimes it's execution on it is that can in my perspective at least sometimes be excruciatingly slow in some culture so as you talk to us about you know figure out and be clear about how choices are made how decisions are made you know, I'm the first one that goes in and helps organizations with process development. I think that's important. I'm also a fan of inclusivity. But anytime we overuse a strength, of course, out of balance, it becomes a weakness. So um, it, I just have seen the overuse of these can create like paralysis by consensus and process. And I'm wondering what are some of the main action blockers you've observed and how do you advise C-suite leaders to clear out? I pictured as a big log jam, Ron. So yep. how do you clear that out so adaptability and action can evolve in months instead of years? I mean, if you if think that, that's possible. If ever, if ever right? It's a, such a fabulous question, Catherine. I love it. You know, it's interesting. We got a call from a company that said, you know, our decision making is way too slow and too stodgy and things are not getting done and people are just languishing. Can you come do a workshop on being more entrepreneurial? <laughs> so, so you've defined this as a skill issue. Um, can I come and poke around? Because I'm guessing it's probably not. Right. right. <laughs> um, governance. There was no governance design in the organization. Um, access to information needed for decisions was limited to very, you know, um, high level people. Approval levels for even the most mundane decisions were layers deep. Oh, gosh. Um, it took months to happen. Um, and nobody thought it was part of their job to actually make decisions. So I said to them, you know, if you're not going to clear all those things up, an entrepreneur workshop really won't do much good. And the answer was, yeah, yeah, we know all those other things are problems, but we think the workshop could at least get things going and then we'll get to those later. Yeah, so I'm not a magician, but 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 good luck. 
Mm-hmm. So the two culprits that I, I most often see, and it's often at the heart of the issue you described, are a diffuse strategy. Meaning if you, walk, if you go around the senior team and say, what's our strategy? You get 10 different answers. So you're all marching to different drums. You're all allocating resources to different priorities. You're all pulling from the same pile of um, uh, effort toward different ends. So you've diffused the organization and diluted it. So clarity of identity. And I don't mean your mission statement and value statement and your annual objectives. I mean, tell me why you're competing to win. Tell me why people who you want to sell something to would pick you over somebody else. How are you differentiated? Why will you win? That's what I mean. And most companies have not answered those questions. So once you've done that, your priorities and then can focus and narrow accordingly. But in, but in the absence of that, everybody gets to be right and have their way. Unclear identity is the first one. The second one is governance. The second one is, you know, the decision rights, the resource allocation, and the authority levels are all separate. So people who are accountable for something don't have the resources and authority to execute it. People who have the resources don't have to actually do the work. People who are accountable for it don't have the authority to actually make decisions. You've distributed decision rights across multiple sets of people who can't, who have no mechanism to bring them together to do the work. What decisions have to be made to execute that strategy with what resources, with what leaders and what uh, data, and how are those people coming around what tables at what frequency to get that done? That's typically, you typically, governance is often like bad wallpaper in a house, right? You go in and there's like eight layers of wallpaper, you know, governance mechanisms and task forces that came to life 10 years ago still have lives of their own. They still meet, they still have budgets, they add no value, but they're still meeting. So you have, you, when you hear the heart cry, we spent all of our days in meetings, we have no time for our day job. Right, right. But it's a screaming signal that your governance has eight layers of wallpaper too deep and has to be blown up and started over. Anyway, those are typically the, the two biggest culprits I see when uh, when you have ex- executional constipation, yes. um, it's not about project better project management. It's not about better productivity tools like Outlook. It's not about you know um, time management skills for people. All right. the all the typical band aids people put on this stuff. You have deeper systemic issues. You've got to get 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 cleaned up and rebuilt. And so many leaders just don't either know to or care to do that work. So they like the band-aids of let's put everybody through a mindfulness exercise so they can be more thoughtful in their meetings. Or let's do meeting techniques to make the meetings better. Or let's give them all project management tools so they can actually manage their priorities better. Or let's, you know, we all know every company survey returns bad communication as an issue. Let's do a newsletter. <laughs> right? So you see all these very cosmetic and superficial choices being imposed across an enterprise that just piss people off because- like you just did not hear me. Oftentimes, to use your wallpaper analogy, my concern sometimes is when people are saying to me, "Oh, I love this wallpaper. It's so much better than the wallpaper we used to have." <laughs> and that's the only criteria, right? It's not that it's the right wallpaper. It's just that I'm out of that pain. Thank you, thank you, Ron, for understanding what I'm saying here. Loving about your work because you can address these issues from data points. Yeah, it's um, it's so funny how people in organizations, they just want to be out of the pain they're in. And yes. that's why so many of them jump from the frying pan to the fire. Because the pain we don't know is feels more alluring and the grass is always greener um, until you realize that the grass is only green when you plant green grass and fertilize it. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> and I, I, I just hope that we are fertilizing the right things, buddy. So... <laughs> Sometimes, so, so often we're not. I mean, you just know they're not. And, and what's really sad about that point, Catherine, is most people know they're not, which is why you have so many, you know, we all know the stat about 70% of the workforce being checked out and 50% of the workforce feeling like they have no sense of purpose. Well, that's why you have them doing busy work that they don't care about. And the hardest part of that is not when the, your great talent quits and leaves. It's, right. when you're mediocre, it's when your mediocre talent quits and stays. Oh, and, that's a great way to put it. And that's what you're stuck with, right? Mm-hmm. So they're happy, they're happy to do your busy work for you and take the paycheck and go home. Yeah. Top talent doesn't want to feel like they're going to work every day and spinning their wheels, same, having the same conversation today that they had four years ago. Yep. You know, that's, that's really hard on people motivationally. And w- with that, I want to uh, shift because maybe address some of those issues in your book. You co-authored the book, Rising to Power, the journey of exceptional leaders. And I wondered if you would please tell us about your connection with your writing partner on that project and how that book evolved. Yeah, thanks. So 
Eric Hansen was my co-author. He's also a partner, uh, managing partner here at Navalent. And the book began with, as I mentioned earlier, the, with that phone call from a, an executive. You know, we had done a very large transformational product in, in design for this company. And on, uh, during the process of design, this one young leader had distinguished himself quite well. He was brilliant. Everybody knew he was brilliant. When he was offered the chance to take on a much broader role in the new design, nobody was shocked. Everybody assumed he'll just, he, he's a rising star, of course. And nine months later, when he called, I assumed he was calling to check in and say hello, but he was calling to tell me he'd been fired. Oh, my gosh. And I, it was just shocking that that had happened. We could, I mean, he was calling, he needed networking help to find a new job. And, oh I, you know, it was, like, it was like I barely could breathe. But two hours later, the CEO called also to let us know he'd been let go. And more than subtly inferring that some of the failure was ours because we hadn't better prepared him for the role. And I, that's devastating. That's like a wrecking ball hitting your head. Yes, it is. But how, how could we have so dramatically misjudged his potential? How, how could we have, I mean, did he, did something dramatic change in his life? How could he have been such a disaster when he was just, you know, the, the rock star everybody loved? I, so I asked the CEO, can we come in and investigate? Can we come in and look around? I, you know, just on our own dime. I just want to understand, you know, if I contributed to this, I never want to do it again. I never want to be on the other end of this phone call again. Right. And that investigation is what led to our 10-year study. Okay. And to find out that he was just another statistic, that 60% of those otherwise very promising folks being elevated to bigger jobs all flamed out within the first year and a half. His took nine months. I understand why the recruiters like this stat because it's an annuity for them. But sh- short of that, why is this? A, why, do, why does HR think this is okay? Why are we playing Russian roulette on a 50-50 d- shot? With people's careers you have families being moved major opportunities being pursued money being spent um for half of it to end up on a carnage pile how how is this okay so i said we can do better we have to do better we set out to, i wanted to turn over every single rock we could identify um we of that 2700 leaders we also then uh, went to 100 leaders and isolated them mid ascent we said let's like watch them in slow motion as they launch up until they land to find every possible landmine being put in their way and expose it so that every shot we can have to help them succeed tap dancing through all the minefields that in fact organizations put in their way yes could be eliminated and that once we're able to identify what were those who were sticking the landing doing breath context choice and connection how do we help them get all of that before they land yes so that was the reason behind the book Um, And what's been obviously, you know, humbling and gratifying to no end is the letters we get, the the emails we get on how many careers we've saved, how many people took very different approaches to entering their jobs because of the book, how many careers on the brink in the jaws of defeat got snatched out and rescued because people, you know, pivoted to a different approach. So we're, we're thrilled that the book is doing what we built it to do, which is prepare people who are heading up toward broader purchase to be successful. Congratulations on the work. My approach, whether it's a podcast interview, a training, writing a book, I try to try to focus. If it helps just one person, it is worth doing. And for you to have that meaningful experience where you get the feedback, where you're helping lots of people, I really congratulate you for that. And it's just so fantastic to know no matter what you're contributing in a positive way. Well, that's kind of you. Thank you for saying so, Catherine. I appreciate that. It's a, uh, they're labors of love. You know this because you've written before too, but my writing for me is how I learn. When my clients ask me questions I can't answer, mm-hmm. if I get asked again, I want to have an answer. So that's how I go off and learn. So many organizational dysfunctions and idiosyncrasies that we've born, even in this, just in this conversation, are so unnecessary. Mm-hmm. We, we can do better. We don't have to settle for broken, uh, mediocre ways of operating. Um, we can we can make even organizations that scale, even large ones, fun, enjoyable, meaningful, impacting places to work. Yes. I think part of the issue might be people don't realize it's broken. What do you say about that? Well, I think I, I think when people, you know, it's a frog in the boiling water, right? When people have, have become so used to a certain level of pain, they don't know any better. And, and you know, one of the hardest contexts for leaders in that situation, because people know they're in pain, right? They, they just, it just, it's, it's a narrative that says I deserve this or this is as good as it gets and I need mm-hmm. the job. So I'm not going to push back. Right. Or I've watched other people try and create change to no end. You know, every company has the, this too shall pass club 
when when all the ch- ch- attempts at change have gone by the wayside. Mm-hmm. And so you have all that cynicism piled up about, is change really possible? And then you have a leader that steps in and really sincerely wants to, to make things better. And now you have, the I think, the most dangerous thing you can ask of an organization is hope. Because you're playing with nitroglycerin. When you ask people to hope for more, and you then dash those hopes if you don't deliver... It's the it's one of the most cruel things leaders do. If you if you dig underneath those statistics about seventy percent of the workforce being disengaged, of those seventy percent, thirty percent of them are actively disengaged. And what that means is they're not just marking time, taking your paycheck. They're trying to sabotage you. Oh my goodness! And that's where your ethical fungus grows. Was people saying, "I'm gonna, uh, it's not fair, it's wrong. I'm gonna get mine." Th- these are not things that just stay static forever. And so, if you're gonna ask hope of an organization, and set sale for a, be- a better horizon, you better deliver yeah. because people deserve more than that. Having stepped into that in- situation where, you know, people are just sort of numb from the neck down and t- uh, in the pain they're in, sometimes you have to wake them up to the pain they're in, right? Sometimes you actually have to help them feel that pain that they've so carefully numbed in order to help them raise up the desire to want something more because the, obviously the journey to get from here to there is not going to be easy. Right. And you have, and they have to want to go and they have to want to believe you're going to get them there. And so sometimes the preparation for that can take months and months and months, right? Too many leaders march in, bring the consultants, announce big change, kick up all the dust and nobody's even ready to go. <laughs> and so the, the, the way leaders, if you're going to construct a journey of transformation, you have to be very thoughtful and very careful about how you till that ground and prepare people for it, especially if it's in the in the wake of many, many other attempts to create change or promises to create change that didn't go well. Can you give us an example of a time that you were hired to go in and kick up the dust without using company names, of course? I, I would just love to hear one of your favorite consulting successes. Gosh, yeah. So family-owned business uh, in Los Angeles, second-generation owners, uh, wonderful business in the creative uh, and production space. And three brothers owned it. Nobody was leading it. They had inherited it from their parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a wonderful, wonderful company, um, but it needed to grow up. It was You had three reluctant leaders who were trying to be co-leaders, and it was not working. Um, only one of them was really clearly CEO material, um, and he was the most reluctant to do it, uh, but beloved. Right? But here you had people in this company who remembered him when he was a little boy and changed his diaper and babysat for him. Right wow. Now he's grown up in the organization. Um, they had two parts of a company. They had gone from the commoditizing production work and were trying to swim up up, to, up the value stream to more strategic work and had been successful at it. And so you know, now it came time to sort of you know, set sail for a future and build a strategy and make hard choices and jettison clients that were not profitable. And aim at these capabilities you had stumbled upon successfully and now get get um, serious about them and grow your leadership. You know, we spent several years with them. The interesting thing was the conversation was started, uh, precipitated in the, in the very beginning by a letter of intent they had received by somebody to say, we want to buy you. And my advice was tear it up. Don't, you're not, you're not ready to sell this company. You don't even know, your parents just gave it to you a couple of years ago. Let's go, let's see what's here. Before you jump at it, because my guess is that you get a very you get a garage sale price for it. So we he, they tore it up. We set sail for the transformational mm-hmm. journey of building an integrated company, of of end to end solutions that that take the best of their production work and the best of their creative and strategy work, integrated it into a beautiful organization design, got got right leaders at the table. It was bumpy. There were mis- missteps and three steps forward and half a step back. Sure. But fast forward. You know, a bunch of years later, they were thriving, growing rapidly, uh, and they were approached again to sell. And they decided that yeah, at that point, they could be better off in a, in a much bigger portfolio of companies and, and sold for an extremely premium price. Uh, it was a beautiful story to watch. And they're gr- great, great people. Not without it. I mean, I, I, that's, the, that, that's the beautiful version of the story. It had a lot of underbelly to it on the way, for sure. But they did the hard work. They were willing to listen to a hard diagnostic set of data and a beautiful, you know, some promising data that they hadn't bet on. They did the hard strategy work of understanding their trade-offs, looking in the mirror of what they were good at, jettisoning what they shouldn't have been doing, um, make hard calls on people that that probably had outgrown the place, um, you know, get people in place that could get the job done 
and shine in the yes. way that only they could shine as an organization and a company and uh, and work at it. They worked really, really hard at it. Um, and it's a it's just a, it was a beautiful story to watch play out. It must have been tremendously satisfying for them to get to that place where they were ready to sell and actually receive the value that it was worth because they could look back over the last few years and see the hard work that they they did to bring it there. And congratulations for you. How fun to be part of that transformation. That's fantastic. Uh, it was very humbling. I know for the for the CEO, who I'm still very close with, um, you know, he, he suffered, right? Because yeah. you know, his two brothers were, you know, they, he had to be their boss, right? Yeah. And that's a difficult thing to do. And, the, you know, that didn't always go as well as you might want it to. And so they each wanted different things. One of them wanted to leave. One of them wanted to stay. He wanted, he was time for him to move on to something else. He went and hired a, a wonderful woman to take his job a pres- as president. But it was, a, it was obviously a lot of mixed emotions, right? Because sure. this is your family legacy. And now you're about to put it in the hands of the first time of someone who's not your family. Yeah. And so, you know, it was a beautiful journey. It was a painful journey. But but watching them do it and watching them rise up, uh, incredibly passionate people. Ta- you know, it was probably three or 400 employees just delightful people, fun people, quirky people <laughs> that cared a lot about their work and it showed yes. and they didn't want to lose their entrepreneurial family tribal vibe and they didn't. Uh, it, it was, you know, uh, whether we were on the field with them or in the stands cheering them on, it was really fun to watch. Fantastic. Well, you have now more than 30 years doing the type of work that you've been doing on, you know, in one form or another. And I'm wondering, Ron, which of your skill sets do you think has contributed most to your success in your career? <laughs> my stubbornness, <laughs> you know, off the top of my head, Captain, I think pattern recognition. Uh, I think my ability to see patterns within organizations and patterns across organizations, because now, I mean, after 30 something years, um, had a call yesterday. It was an emergency call from a, an organization who's going through a big, a, a classic, you know, front page scandal. Um, it's it's an older scandal, but it's been resurfaced and t- Twitter bots made it worse. Yes. Right? And they're panicking. And of course, it's a it's the culture. Everybody reaches for the culture level when they don't know what else to do. Yeah. And, you know, within 20 minutes of the conversation, I'm like, OK, I'll bet this is happening. And I'll bet this happened. I'll bet you heard this. I'll bet you've asked this question and got this answer. Uh, and the guy's thinking, Are you, do you have a video camera in my office? <laughs> I'm like, I've seen this movie so many times. Yes. And so let me tell you, you know, if we never speak again, if you don't have us in to help you, please listen to this, do these things. Because I know exactly how to screw it up more. And I know what I know what things have worked in those situations to to help people navigate treacherous waters. So I think my pattern library is probably one of the um, the most helpful things that helped me get help leaders, especially in triage moments. Get to uh, get to a stabilized place more quickly, um, and I think a sense of humor, right? You yes. have to win a lot. You, you, we just can't take this stuff so seriously, and so being able to, you know, crack the well time. I'm, I'm, you know, from a, a, a classic New York Italian family, so sarcasm is genetic for us, and so being able to, you know, poke fun at things at the right time helps disarm tensions and defenses, and help people sort of take a breath and go, okay, it's going to be okay. That's right. And to circle back to where you started, I think oftentimes that sense of humor can balance out the stubbornness because I, I, for one, vote for stubbornness, you know, <laughs> in balance. Uh, but yeah, with a sense of humor, I think that can all work out pretty good. I, I like to think of it as will, willful conviction. Yeah, there you go. Like, t- turns out that labeling it something nice doesn't make other people experience it any better. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Well, I love to get this idea of some of your background and then to where you're headed. And I think that continuous learning is central to effective leadership. So I'm wondering, what have you learned recently and how did you learn it? So uh, interesting timing on that question. So we went, we decided that this, this wonderful database of of rich data that we had from these interviews uh, had been growing. So, you know, we, Rising to Power was done at the 10-year mark, but now it's 15 years, and I wondered what was in there. So we went, we went back to the, the basket to see, you know, so we had isolated for individual leadership behavior. What, what can we learn about the system? What can we learn about how organizations are, are working these days that might be some interesting patterns? And what was fascinating is what we learned about was honesty. We learned about what, you know, we've, we've, we've known for years that, you know, ethics and 
um, truth telling are not just a function of individual character choices, right? There are systemic factors mm -hmm. that absolutely can shape whether or not someone withholds or distorts the truth. And turns out we found four. Um, and it's not just the culture. Um, we were able to find very predictable levers um, that predict whether or not people in your organization will withhold or distort the truth from you um, and create an honest organization that's safe to tell the truth. So that's been a really exciting thing to learn about um, and write and begin to write about and begin to sort of figure out how we build solutions for that. Because I think in a, in a day we all recognize the truth as being very hard to find uh, and reliable, trustworthy leaders being able to harder and harder to detect because, you know, they all, they all sound so credible and authentic because they've been coached, but you don't really know, but, mm -hmm. but is this the real deal? Right. So I think we're very excited about, about the future of what that, that those insights can mean for us and what we can learn uh, from how to create organizations of integrity. Yeah. I mean, and if you want to, so that we've did our first, we published the data in HBR uh, last month. If you want to put the link, it's a, the article was called four ways lying becomes normal at a company. So you can put the link on your show notes if you want to. I will. I'm taking a note of it <laughs> right now. That's awesome. Well, one of the things I really like about doing podcast interviews with thought leaders is that I like to get to know people beyond them in their consulting world, but a little bit personally and what they're into. And because I think when we love our work, it's just so easy to be working a lot of the time or most of the time or whatever you want to call it. It's not always compartmentalized, but certainly downtime and having things that we're interested in outside of our quote unquote jobs, I think is important. And in your case, I understand you collect antique doorknobs, door knockers and skeleton keys. And uh, I just smiled when I read about that because there is something about antique glass doorknobs that I'm really drawn to. I just love holding them, looking at them, and I make myself not buy them because I have <laughs> other collections of things. But I wondered if you could share with us how you got it started in these collections and how these objects inspire you. So that's a great fun. I'm, I'm turning around looking at my office, looking at them even as we speak. Um, so it's not so much a collection as it is there. They, they, they started out as art pieces. Yeah. So I did, I decided to do as almost like an installation art piece for a friend um, who, who, who I was mentoring. Um, and it was the notion that, you know, life's really about opening doors. It's about um, all the doorways that have gone before us. And so if you think about uh, a, a glass jar filled with, the beautiful colors and shapes of keys and door knockers and doorknobs of, you know, up to a hundred years of age, mm -hmm. um, just displaying in this beautiful glass jar. If you think about the, the stories, the number of hands that have crossed those thresholds, the number of um, doors that those, the number of secrets, those doors kept held the number of um, uh, transitions, those doors guided. It really is an endless story of, of and and for those of us in in the helping profession, that's what our job is. So I started making these installation pieces for people in fields of helping others navigate, you know, rough hard thresholds, mm -hmm. navigate the the liminal spaces of the world where we have to go from now to next and somehow find a way in between. To remember that our job is about all the doors that have come before us and all the doors that will come after us, and how it is we work to open them and or keep knocking on them until they open for us, mm -hmm. or at least help somebody else find the keys to open it themselves. Uh, and then after I made like four or five of these, I thought I said, I want one for myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to make, uh, uh, it ended up being a set of them. I, I, I chose this really, really very tall vessel to, to do mine in, and of course it was, I overreached and it exploded. Um, so I needed to get three smaller vessels to put mine in. So that's how I got mine, but but I, they're in my uh, right by the couch in my office on the coffee table where I get to look at them every day. Um, and my wife actually got creative. She put them on these little lazy Susans so that you can turn them and so you can see them from all angles. And it, it's a wonderful reminder to me, I, I, at least when I let them remind me, that you know there are so many doors uh, in front of me. There are so many doors I get to open. Uh, there are so many doors I get to bang on until someone opens them. Yes. Uh, when necessary. So uh, it's really the the, the uh, a, a emblem of my work. First of all, I love the idea of you putting these collections together for other people and then recognizing how powerful it is. And 
the other thing that's just happening in this moment is that our paths have crossed in kind of a beautiful way because I am a contributor on Shutterstock Photography. Yeah. And yesterday, one of the pieces that I uploaded was a turquoise door in Santa Fe that was partially open into a courtyard. So, yeah, I put on the heading, you know, when one door closes because it has that partial opening. And it's it's neat to know that that's kind of woven into your philosophy and the items that you like as well. So thank you for sharing that with us, Ron. I really what's appreciate so, what's, it. And what's so powerful about that picture that you're describing, Catherine, is I, I'm on the board of a nonprofit called Liminal Space. And it is a nonprofit that is devoted to people who are working through transitions, um, people who are trying to navigate from now to next. And the first logo of... The, of the middle space was a turquoise partly open door. No way. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the folder right here going, I hope this is not her picture. Um, That's um, amazing. But, yeah, about four years ago. I think it's still on the website too for some of the courses we offer. But yeah, it was a turquoise aged, beautifully painted crack turquoise uh, half open door. That's amazing. I love these moments, right? That I knew I was looking forward to talking with you today, but it's been even more fun than I anticipated. And as we begin to wrap it up, you know, as consultants, we are often guiding goal setting for other people. And then I'm wondering, Ron, if you could please share a professional goal you've set for yourself this year and then also a personal goal. The professional goal, it's a little bit of a raw nerve. So I've set some goals for this research on honesty. I, you know, it's one of those, you set the goal, you take it back. You set the goal, you take it back. You you wish you hadn't set the goal. You know, you, should, you set the goal. So I'm entertaining the notion of what goals I might want to pursue for this research. Yes. <laughs> but but my ambivalence about the work it would take is consuming me. So you can think the good thoughts for me. Um, so there's there's a goal implied uh, with how to take that those insights to the world. Yes. <laughs> um, but, but all great visions devolve into real work. Well, I've declared the goal several times, but then I've just taken them back. But so sort of <laughs> stick with them and do them. That's that's what I'm trying to figure out now. I so appreciate your honesty, Ron. Please it's, continue on to a personal goal. This stuff's hard. Yes. Um, personally, um, I think this year, um, so my wife and I will be celebrating our 30th anniversary. So we have some travel plans. Yay. We want to make this year. That's a goal. Uh, I have some some other sort of um, health goals. So I've been, you know, I'm pretty um, avid in my own health and keeping my being staying active. And this year, I want to continue to stay active outdoors on my bicycle and on my tennis court. And I've definitely set some fitness goals this year to sustain. I, I, about two, a little over two years ago, I lost about 35 pounds. Wow! Just to get down to a more healthier weight, um, and I've actually kept it off um, to a you know a, a place where my clothes actually fit me. That's and, incredible. You're breaking so, the trend there, speaking about patterns. I know. I'm trying I'm trying to keep it's hard. It's really hard at, you know, uh, at my age, it's not it doesn't come easy. So anyway, trying to I think the goal to sustain that commitment. Yes. Uh, in the face of re, of of many temptations to regress. <laughs> yes. The, well, congratulations in two areas. One, keeping love alive for 30 years. Incredible. Congratulations to you and your wife. And uh, congratulations on not just losing that weight, but keeping that off. It, because, you know, a lot of times, I think in the kind of work that we do with our energy and focus on helping other people, whether it's teachers, people in healthcare at hospitals or consultants, um, sometimes it's just easier to focus on taking care of other people instead of taking care of ourselves. So I appreciate your ability to do that. Self, self-care is so important in the health profession. If you're not taking care of your own body, mind, and soul, Yes. You'll, you're going to limit how much help you can give other people. So true. Well, as we begin to wrap it up, people can contact you at navalent.com. Mm-hmm. They can connect with you on LinkedIn. They can purchase your book on Amazon. And I'm wondering, Ron, is there anything else you would like the Relatable Leader audience to know? Well, gosh, and um, also Twitter, if you like to get content that way on my Twitter as well. Okay. Um, you know, and, and we also have, a, I'd like to offer you a, a free gift from us. Wonderful. So if um, if you're in the process of getting ready to lead some important changes, if you come to navalin.com slash transformation, we have a free ebook for you 
on it's our playbook on leading transformation. It's how we construct the, the transformational journeys we spoke about earlier in the conversation. So if you want to get a look into how we do it, or you know, think about the one you have to that's in front of you, we'd love for you to have that playbook from us to help guide you uh, away from the cliff. Folks, please take advantage of that. When people offer us free information, why not? And I would even suggest no matter what role you have in your organization, if you ever plan on being promoted or pursuing a leadership position, the time to start acting like a leader and thinking like a leader is now. Don't wait until you have that opportunity come up for you. So please take advantage of that transformation ebook that Ron is offering. Ron, I thank you so much for your time today. It was an absolute delight to talk with you. I love your energy and your ideas, and I look forward to reading your book so that I can frankly, tap into more of your wisdom. Catherine, that's very kind of you. It's been a real delight. Thanks so much for having me on your show. And uh, thanks for all your work in the world out there to help get the insights out to your to you, those you know. It's uh, we, we appreciate the, the, the good work you do as well. Thanks so much, Ron. Okay, Relatable Leader audience, do check those show notes for two links. One to Ron's article, Four Ways Lying Becomes Normal at a Company, and also that free ebook at navalent forward slash transformation. Thank you for joining me here at the Relatable Leader Podcast. It is my mission to support your success through tools and knowledge you can apply immediately. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode. Until then, take good care of yourselves and lead by example.